And now, weighing in out of the blue corner, Josh the Pong Thompson. 100% agree. And on the other mic, he weighs in from the red corner, Big John McCarthy. Yeah, baby. Yeah, that, that is that is the Pong. That is Josh the Pong Thompson right there looking oh, good. Yeah. 45 years of age, still has a jawline, hardly a gray right. hair on his head. Oh, but quite chin. a few coming out there on the chin yeah. there, mister. I, I kind of know what that fucking feels this like. This whole right? side is gray. It's driving me crazy, man. This man, side did I so have bad. the day today? I don't even want to talk about your, your jawline and shit now. I, we got to go over. This is, we are filming this on Easter Sunday. Yes. Because look, at we had to you know, alter things based upon kids oh, and stuff. Absolutely. And well, my day was special. I heard you had you had I some have... bull problems, <laughs> dude. I had the biggest goddamn bull break into my pasture, and then my bull decides, "Oh fuck you." Right, and that bull says, "Oh no, no, fuck you!" And they're fighting, dude. How do they fight? They, like head to oh, head? They, they they ram heads. Yeah, they ram heads and drive. Can they die um, that way? Oh yeah, they'll, oh. they'll they'll go to the point they die. Shit. Right. So I go out there just to I'm gonna move what's called a harrow. I'm gonna get stuff done, right? Because I have a goat that's having a uh, it's gonna be having a kid, a baby. It's called a kit, mm -hmm. but. I'm, I've got my grandson with me, and we've got an Easter egg thing to go to. I want to watch my grandson, you know, get the Easter eggs. He loves picking stuff up and everything, right? Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. No, I had to try to uh, get between two bulls that were killing each other. And the best part is I thought of you. No. I swear to God. <laughs> it was, they're two heavyweights. Yeah. And, man, heavyweights get tired. <laughs> And so they're pushing, and then all of a I mean, they're going for a while, though. When it got into the fifth round, I am telling you right now, both of them, tongue out, hanging about a foot from their mouth. <laughs> <laughs> right? And then, <laughs> and you're watching their bodies heave and stuff, right? And then my my daughter gets in the damn uh, my side-by-side, -side and she's trying to cut off this bull as it's going after, you know, Big Red and Big Red's trying to twist around and go to it, and they, they they're kind of running each other off. And as she, you know, I get into the side by side with her, and she cuts a corner too hard, rolls that yeah. some bitch. So I rolled over in that right. She falls on top of me. That my 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 finger dislocates, oh. right? And I'm like ah, right. So I pop it back, <laughs> get up. And this, I couldn't find the owner because the the land next to me is leased by a by a person so i don't know who owns the damn bull uh, so i'm trying to find out so finally have to cut the fence to try to get the bull back into their that pasture mend the fence get all of my damn cows and into another pasture it was just a mess so by the time i got done yeah i didn't see one damn thing with uh, my grants <laughs> And it was over. That's not his first Easter, though, right? It's first real Easter where he can get up and walk yeah. around. God, it's the first. He's a year and a you know, eighteen, months? almost a year and a half yeah. now. Yeah, damn, that sucks. Did you at least eat one of the animals? Oh, <laughs> dude, I swear to God, yeah, I was, I, I was to the point. I'm like, I'm gonna shoot this goddamn bull. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's pissing me off. Oh, but he was, you know, I, I rode a bull when I was young. Mm -hmm. Right when I when I was a police officer, I got challenged to do it, so I rode the bull. Right, got thrown on my head, but I, he he spun me around, so I kind of went off of him like I was a frisbee. Mm -hmm. So it really didn't hurt that bad. It was like I was if I was going to go off of something, that was the way to go off of it. Right, I just kind of was like a skipping stone ac across the dirt. Rolled, get up, I'm I'm out. Right, and I I always have those memories of how strong bulls are. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like the, I looked at this bull, and it, honest to God, it's I, I said 1800 pounds, probably 2500 pounds, just freaking man. You know, he's as tall as me, his head's as <laughs> it's when he stands straight, you're like, Oh, Jesus Christ. And I'm like, And I'm gonna get in the way of that. Yeah, well, I'm gonna lose this battle, but it was fun, it was a battle the whole day. <laughs> You have a hunting rifle? Because I would have finished that real quick. Oh, dude, I got more than a hunting <laughs> rifle, son. <laughs> I, uh, trust me. 
I thought about it after a while. I was like, all right, if they don't find out who this some bitch belongs to quick. Yeah. If you don't know who owns it, I mean, hey, it's oh, fair no. game, right? Just put it out of its misery and put some uh put some meat in your uh in your free in your freezer. Dude, I, I figure at least eleven hundred pounds of hamburger. I don't care. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't want to deal with that lawsuit if someone did find out you did kill it. Yeah. <laughs> but oh nice. man. Um, how'd your grandson do with the, uh, Easter egg? Hunt? Oh, he cleaned up. They had 990 Jeez. some eggs out there and uh, he got his little basket full. So Good. he was happy. Good for him. He was Good happy. Him. I just missed it. Ah, oh, that sucks. That's, That's all right. By dislocated finger and, you know, and, uh, one bull saved. Good. <laughs> I mean, you know, did, 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 that, did that other bull get a chance to mount any of your, uh, cows? No. Oh, no, damn. No, no, no. I mean, free, free no. fertilizer. <laughs> oh. <laughs> all all of my cows are pregnant oh nothing wrong by with that. by my bull oh not nothing so. wrong with that good job that's what he's doing what he's supposed to do right oh he's doing his job doing his job lucky yeah, son this one bitch. was coming over to try to get a little it, man i'll tell you what it is the it's no different than men and you know man, it's the same thing it's like oh you're gonna come over here okay okay that's so funny yeah. oh it was hysterical yeah, I stopped fighting over women a long time ago. Oh, it's thank just, you very much. I'm too old for that no, shit. It's just too much stress, man. I don't need that. There's, there's, let's, what is there, like 8 billion, 9 billion people on this earth? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so half of those, let's just say, what, four and a half? Four and a half 51%. billion are females? Yeah, gotta be so 51%. Let's just say, let's just say four, females. four billion is females. Okay. There's plenty to choose from. You think plenty so? Plenty to choose from, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you don't like any in this country, there's You think you plenty. might find one? just maybe maybe with this jawline i mean how could i how could they resist? Oh, that's true yeah. how could they resist so i mean hard. look bottom line is if dave can get some ass fucking any of us can oh <laughs> dude i thought dave Ooh. tossing his woman around rolling her down the thing dave, dave's definitely great. marrying up if any of you guys this team dave's <laughs> wife man he's definitely marrying up look at his ugly ass mug <laughs> Oh, you know, yeah, I can't argue there. I really can't argue. No, there. you can't argue there, man. No, you can't. Especially if you guys had seen the old photos of him dressed up like Eminem. God, <laughs> just realizing <laughs> what she's getting herself into. This poor lady. Hey, um, it's all right. We all make mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And his wife's making one. No, <laughs> no, no I'm, talking about the, I'm talking about the Eminem clothing. Oh, the Eminem clothing, the hair dye, all the whole bit. Jeez. That's so funny. Just uh, bleach the tips. All right, guys. Well, hey, we have a we have a pretty good show, man. There was actually the UFC had some interesting fights. Obviously, there's a lot to talk about on John's side of this platform. <laughs> I mean, I, I went a little I went a little nuts on Twitter yesterday and uh, over some over one of the refs. Look, we'll get into that in a little bit. But uh, look, overall though, before uh, before we get started. Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button on our platform. I want to thank you guys so much for subscribing to us, and um, hope you guys enjoy the show, man. We we continue to put out more content as much as we possibly can, but hit the bell and the thumbs up. That will also uh, share our videos out to everyone else you guys know and uh, share our videos onto your social media platforms if you guys like clips, you know. And uh, we want to thank you guys so much for supporting us. Also, we did a, I did a live just the other day, another live on the OF channel on the OnlyFans.com slash weighing in. Man, I can't believe it. We're up to like 800, 800 viewers now or 800 subscribers now over there. It's right free. On. It's free, guys. It's free. So we're having some fun over there. Live chats over there. Questions, Q and A's, all that stuff. So uh, hit us up over there. It is free. Um, look, you guys don't have to view any of the other smut that's on smut that's on there. Just uh, subscribe to us. All There's a ton of athletes on there as well that we could continue to support. Uh, DJ being one of them. Stipe Miocha being one. Uh, Amanda Hebis. Who else? Chris Cyborg. <laughs> AJ McKee. Luke Rockhold. Luke Rockhold. Speaking of it, we're going we're gonna to talk about Luke Rockhold a little bit today as well. So there's some big fight announcements we're going to have on this show. So make sure you guys uh, tune in for the rest of this show. But let's start off first with the UFC on ESPN. Is it, what is this? ESPN what? 54? Is it? No? Atlantic City. I know. Atlantic City. Yeah, so this is a fight night ESPN Jeez. 54. All right. So ESPN, uh, UFC on ESPN 54. Uh, Mano Faro versus Aaron Blanchfield. John, how did you see it? I saw it like the judges. <laughs> saw it, let's be honest. Yeah. You know? It was uh, Aaron Blanchfield trying, you know, working hard to try to get takedowns and everything. But I am, I think she actually threw more shots, you know, probably threw more punches and everything. But it's about what hits and what hits with any type of 
you know, power and, and the, the power and the, the accurate striking went to Faro and she just was in her mm-hmm. element as far as she kept the fight in the standing position for the most part. She just, you know, controlled. The one thing that I will say, and I think she needs to figure out how to get past this, is you get to a certain point and it's it's all about just let me get the win. Mm-hmm. And I understand that. And and it's it is important that you get the win. But it looked like she was almost point fighting. There was times that she could have opened up and instead instead of opening up and going after the next volume of combinations that were available for her to go after, she backed off. And it looked like she was just saying, I'm just going to you know, score points. It's like a point karate tournament, which is where she kind of came from. And she's going to have to get out of that mindset because, you know, even someone, you know, that's not having the greatest night like Aaron Blanchfield as far as, you know, being uh, successful with her techniques and her game plan of what she's going to do. All it takes is one shot to put you on the deck and then she's on top of you and then you, you know, you're know you out. She she did a good job in the early part of, you know, defending against the guillotine. It was tight for a moment. But, you know, look, she dominated the fight for the most part. Kept it where, and you know, we said, this all depends on where the fight goes. If it stays on the feet, you're going to see Mano Ferro winning this fight. If it goes to the ground, you're going to see Aaron Blanchfield winning this fight. Well, where was the fight? Yeah. Just about... 100% on the feet. So, do you remember in the last show I said I felt like Meno Faro was a lot bigger than her? And then we looked yeah. at the stats and they were basically the same. Like Meno yeah, had boy, like a were, little bit They t- were not was, were they? No. Like physically the size looked so much different out there. And strength. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't even get to the strength because the si- physical size of it all was just you can see when they stood in the center of the cage. And I thought maybe just because I had saw Aaron Blanchfield fight someone that was maybe more her size, maybe just felt like she was a lot smaller. No, she physically yeah. looked a lot smaller in this fight. And I couldn't figure out what was going on and why, but they got out there and I can see in the first clinch, I was like, holy cow. The first clinch ended up in the takedown for Manel Feroz. Big slam, all these things led right into a guillotine, but it was still in that position where I looked at her. I'm like, you look, your arms look longer, which they are not, by the way, they are shorter. Her kicks and her legs that's were what it said. Well, hold it. That's what it says. Yeah, that's what it says. <laughs> it sure didn't look like it. It sure didn't no. look like it. And the height, I mean, there was a four or three inch reach, uh, three inch height advantage, but it looked a lot bigger than three inches. Um, you know, and I mean, I've been told that a, a lot lately, you know, too, like it's bigger than three inches, but it just came <laughs> down when I saw the two of them face to face in the cage. It just looked yeah. a lot different. Everything looks, she looks so much bigger than Aaron Blanchfield. And how old is Aaron Blanchfield? 23? She's young. Yeah. No, how old little, is she? Little, I want to say 26. 24. 24. And then how old is uh, Menno? Older than that. Yeah, like 30. 34. 34. 34. I just, I, I get into the same, I get in the same conversations with some of the young fighters that are young men. They physically look good. But that physical strength is not there. They're not women yet. They're not men yeah. yet. Like they haven't hit that prime where they, you can tell that they have the strength, like that man strength just yet. I look at Aaron Blanchfield and that's what we have. She's not quite there yet. And I've said this, I, I said this on the Joe Rogan podcast back in 2020. I said, women don't hit their peak. I, I feel like for me anyways, no, and I think a bit they're prime until like 32 to 36, 38, somewhere in there. You know, and and I think it's kind of fallen true. Every time I've seen a young female come up in the sport, they don't really have that it thing until like they hit that 20, 28, 29, 30, 28 31. to 35. Yeah. Is that, yeah, I agree with like you. Like the men can get it at 26, 27, but they're in their actual real prime. Women are getting it kind of like in 29, 30 to 31, 32 is when they're starting to hit their their peak prime athletic ability, I believe. I mean, we've seen professional athletes, uh, whether they're U.S. Olympic swim team, all that stuff. Like they, there's Olympic gold medalists that are 40, you know, that placing in the Olympics, 40, 41, 42. Women just have a different body that can make those adjustments. And I think it's been proven over and over again. Whereas men, they start to really, truly decline at 35, 36, 37. You know, you get a couple outliers, you know, in the heavier weights because, 
you know, heavier weight uh, athletes are just not as skilled, you know, and, uh, you know, us, like us younger. And Unless smaller. they're bulls. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> You know, so, um, but I looked at this as soon as I saw them come out, as soon as I saw the big slam and less men got tired, I just saw men just running away with this fight. And it, she did. Yeah, she did. She really she did. did. And I really believe had the fight been on the ground for longer than 12 seconds, you know, then I think that Aaron, Aaron Blanchfield would have probably worked to some way to get a submission. She just was never able to get that fight there. Yeah. Not at all. No. So it, it really was a sign of, and, and I've used this, this, uh, analogy for, for young men as well. It was, it was like a, a woman against a young girl, just like, oh, different, like a man against a boy. It yeah. was, it, that's what it felt like when I was watching the fight. It gave me a little flashbacks just without the, it was obviously a different outcome of Misha Tate and a uh, Holly Holm. Yeah. A little bit, you know, different in the fact that you know at least Misha had, I believe, it was the second round where she came out. And she had a ten eight round. Yeah. She was really putting it on. Misha she was had, also you know, a grown position. woman at that time. Yeah, I, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and it was. I watch in watching this fight though. I really got to compliment uh, the the attitude of Aaron Blanchfield and the heart of Aaron Blanchfield and the fact that. Look, it's, when things aren't going your way, it's tough. Mm -hmm. And to keep on going back time and time again in trying to close distance and you're taking shots, and she took a lot of shots, and to stick with it, and, and you could tell she was in shape. Mm -hmm. She had, you know, she had gas after taking a bunch of, you know, shots, you know, both to the, the head and the body at times, still had gas in that fifth round. Mm -hmm. She was going, but she just doesn't have that physical strength to overpower uh, Mano. And Mano, Mano is obviously physically strong. We saw it, and we kind of saw it when she fought Rose, mm -hmm. and Rose kind of got into some clinch situations and just kind of got pushed off. And, you know, anytime she wanted to break out of something, she was able to. Obviously, physically, she's very strong. Mm -hmm. She uses that well, but she doesn't get tired using it. So, you know, it's a great, it's a great gift that she has. And she definitely, you know, she deserved that win. She's got it. And we'll see if you know, they're going to put her up against Alexa Grasso. Well, Alexa's fighting the probably Valentina Shevchenko after they get done with the Tough Series, correct? Yeah, I would, a think. Fighter. I would think. I guess the question then lies, like, do you want to wait that long if you're Manon Faro? I don't know. You know, do you want to try to, you know, sit out and wait it's going to be a while, you know. I would say, you know, I, you know there's a lot of people who are going to sit there and believe that it's better to just wait. I always say the more active you are, the more your skill set mm -hmm. stays or even increases. And don't sit. You know, she's th you know, we just saw she's 34 years of age. She's in the prime of her uh, fighting career. Well, she's now 7-0 and in the UFC. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would, I would uh, absolutely recommend... I don't care who the opponent is. She's going to match up well with him, and she uh, Dave, pull, she should continue fighting. Pull up her, her rankings and her weight class. Straw weight, right? No, oh, it's, sorry. It's going to be flyweight. Flyweight. Fly fly uh, uh, uh. Yeah. She's third right now, and Aaron Blanchfield was the only one you know, besides Valentina. And so she stepped over Aaron Blanchfield. Valentina will still be number one. She'll be number two. You remember when I started this year off, and I said, don't be surprised if Macy Barber gets a title shot? Yeah, but Macy's Macy I know has a got a staff infection. Okay, She's been bad. But my point is though, is that like I believe that they're gonna try to maybe match her against someone like a Macy Barber, Aaron Bl not Aaron, but uh, Menno, in the in the middle of all this, they are gonna make a Good. push. And I and I honestly, after watching Macy Barber and her aggressiveness, and watching what Aaron Blanchfield was able to land, there was moments during that fight last night where she literally caught Mano and Mano, I could see the face, her face cringed like she got hit hard. She looked a little stunned at some moments. Macy Barber is a dog. Not hurt. Not, not, not hurt. Not hurt, but just stunned. Ooh, surprised. Like surprised, like, oh, I got hit with a clean, hard shot. And you could see the face was like, and for those of you guys listening to our audio platforms, it was, it was a very, very uh, disgusting face. It very was, cringy face. Very cringy face. It was like... It was it was that look of, oh, I I got hit really hard and that hurt, 
and Macy Barber, whereas Aaron Blanchfield stopped and didn't continue on, Macy Barber is going to continue on, whether it's with elbows, whether it's with knees, whether it's with takedowns. Just that, I feel like I feel like Macy Barber is, sorry, Aaron Blanchfield is where Macy Barber was three years ago. Do you, do you kind of remember she was going through that like weird, awkward oh, yeah. phase of just trying Absolutely. to figure out like who, yeah. she's who she was, where she was at. Exactly. And now she is really can't kind of come into her own. I said this at the beginning of the year. I said, don't be surprised if Macy Barber ends up getting that title shot here in this year and, and potentially winning the title. She's got something right now. She's on a roll. The confidence is up. And I think, I think that the UFC is not going to let Mano stick it out because honestly, last night, the way that she dominated that, dominated that fight, she should have put her away. She should have tried to take a couple more chances. She should, you have seen, oh, yeah. you know, Dana hates that shit. Oh, yeah. He hates when fighters go, Oh, I'm, I'm up on the scorecards. I'm just going to keep yeah. just picking her apart, just... sticking and moving. He fucking hates that. I'm not giving yeah. you a title shot off of that shit. Like that's what he, that's the way he thinks. I don't blame him. You want finishers. And so when I look at, you've got Macy, who is a dog, who's going to bring that fight to her. And you got Mano, who's going to have to wait six months before that, because they're filming right now for what, four to six weeks. Then the whole show will take four to six weeks, you know, easy. And then you're going to have, then you're going to have the fight. And then whoever wins that fight is going to want a little bit of time off. You're not fighting until November, December. All right. And so if you're a man for the UFC, you're like, no, you need to get a fight in between. We want you to fight. And if you don't want to fight, cool. You can sit on the silence. I've had that same conversation, by the way, with Joe Silva. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I'm speaking from experience. I understand exactly what they're going to be telling her. Yeah. Um, but I thought she had a good performance. Look, let's not take away from Menno's it performance. Was. She had a great performance. Look, she dominated, for the most part, dominated the fight, dominated mm-hmm. every round as far as keeping it where it wanted. I'm not saying she dominated in that, you know, Aaron had no, you know, effect in the fight or anything like that. It's just she was able to keep it where she wanted, Mm -hmm. and she just outpointed her continuously. Landed the cleaner, better shots throughout the fight. I'm trying to remember what round, but I thought I thought Aaron won maybe the fourth round. I think it was maybe the fourth round. Remember, she came out hot, yeah, kind of hit her with some clean shots. It looked like she kind of rocked Mano a little bit, had her on her back leg. But then the last like two minutes of the fight of the round. She kind of yeah. gave that away or kind of lost position. He got hit with some clean, hard shots. So I could have seen how it went the other way as well. But I think I gave one of the rounds to uh, to Aaron Blanchfield. Not that it means anything, but, yeah. you know. Uh, what I did like, though, John, is, I don't know if you heard, but I like the cornering of Aaron Blanchfield. You need yeah. to win this fight. You need, like, as in, oh, yeah. you, you need you to. You need to get after yeah. her. You need, you need to, to finish. This fight to, you need yep. to finish. And I love yeah. that about coaches. Great job. They were honest with her. I thought they started a little bit too late, though, to be honest. They they were kind of still babying her in the first and two rounds. That third round, there should have been some, hey, we need yeah. this round to stay in this fight. A little bit of urgency on it. Yeah. yeah, that was it. Like Otherwise, though, I thought they did a great job. The, whoever's corner, I thought they did a great job. They did a good yeah. job. So I wanted to say that. Look, at, they, have, they have a really good fighter there. They do. Blanchfield. They really do. She's just got some maturing as a woman to do the physical strength to build a little mm-hmm. bit and a little bit better with, you know, a variety of takedown mm-hmm. attempts, not going back to the same thing yeah. over and over, you know, and it'll be there. I mean, we've been dealing with Dave for a while now and his maturity and like from a woman to like now becoming a man, <laughs> it's come a long ways. We've done a great job with him. So it's good. Dave, there you go. Next fight. <laughs> We had Joaquin Buckley taking on Vicente Luque. Uh Joaquin coming back to the welterweight division from middleweights. He's done very well with the middleweights. He's had he's had just an absolutely uh, outstanding career so far in the UFC. Joaquin Buckley has really shown he was. You know, this is where you know when people say Joaquin Buckley was a Bellator fighter. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, three and two in Bellator. You know, and but we. Back then, we looked and said, hey, that guy can fight. Yeah. And he really could. And uh, he's he's showing his stuff. He's showing, man, he is just a good, solid fighter that can fight everywhere. Well, they released him after he lost to Logan Story. They're like, ah, just yep. can't stop wrestling. Da, da, da. Oh, yeah, you get taken down and you can't even get up. Mm. Yeah, I mean, but. Who he's going against. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, Joaquin's good, man. I think this is the weight class for him. He's got to just stay yep, strict so on I. his diet. 
I thought 185 yeah. was never his weight class. Should have never been fighting there. Um, Vicente Luque, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say something probably is gonna hurt a lot of people's feelings right now. He's done. He doesn't look like he wants to be out there. He doesn't look like the same fighter. This is true. I don't I don't want to say no style like like uh technique wise, he looks like the same fighter. But John, his mentality you can see he does no, not I, look like he wants to be there. That's what I that's what I'm okay. talking about when I say he doesn't look like the same. Vicente Luque was that guy, in my opinion. Man, you'd hit him, and he he was always you know wanting to get it back. He always you know you touched him, he wanted to, to put one over on you. He wanted to show you, uh, uh-uh, I'm not I'm not giving in. It just didn't look like the same guy, and it looked like when he could not you know deal with the stand up, and then when he he went for the, he pulled him into guard. Mm-hmm. When have you ever seen Vicente Luque pull someone into guard? This is what kind of this is what kind of got me, John, was that. I think they said it was his his grandpa had never seen him fight in person. And his grandfather was there. Yeah. And that's the performance you gave. I mean, I'm sorry, man. I'm going I'm going out straight on my shield. Like <laughs> if my grandfather's there, I don't give a fuck. And I hate to, I mean, like, even at 50 years old, you're gonna have to knock me the fuck out. I don't know. Uh, I just don't I see it in him right now. I don't know what it is. I don't know if something happens. Something happened in the gym. I don't know if it's just confidence in there from the fights he's had. And I really, really like Vicente Luque. I like everything about him. He carries himself with class. He's very damn good on the ground and on the feet. Very good on the feet. He's got a beautiful darts. He's good. He he locks in submissions well. His stand-up is great. But even Joaquin Buckley said, look what he said in the interview, right there in the cage, he just gave up. Yeah. I don't know. I, I've never seen that out of someone like, like like him, like not not the personality he has. Seems like nah, he would go out, he would go out like on his shield, and it just I didn't see that last night. I felt like something something is going on with him mentally. I don't know if there's some physical attributes that maybe he's got some injuries. I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, before he steps back foot in that cage, I want to see every. I want to see a revise. I want to see a. A confident one, someone that just has dealt with whatever the demons are inside of him that he's dealing with. I don't know what it is, John, but that's not the guy that we grew up watching and liking to watch fight. No, the cage. He, he, it looked like this was this was the fight. He just, but you know, there, there's those fights, and I'm going to say it, you're just out of tune for the entire fight. And in this one, it just seemed like Buckley was a step ahead of him the whole time. Buckley was the one that was throwing the hard, harder shots throughout. Buckley was opening up. And, you know, let be honest, Josh. Some of the things, you know, and they were the commentators were giving some, you know, credence to Buckley's lateral movement. He was taking incredibly large angles yeah. at times, stepping through and in, out. And you looked at and Vicente just let it happen over and over. And those are the things when someone does those explain things. Explain to people. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna say, explain to people why you don't you don't allow that to happen. Yeah, because you're getting put in a position where someone can hit you, mm-hmm. and you don't have the angle to hit them back. And so you look and you say, okay, I see what you're doing. So as you take that step, now I am taking a step to make sure that I cut that off, and I can throw. And now you're out of position. Yeah. And you look and you go, he didn't do that once. And that's what really surprised me when I was watching the fight. I was I was watching Buckley just footwork creating problems for Vicente and Vicente never correcting those things. And that's what I was looking at. I said, man, something's off. Yeah, fight those board. problems could have been fixed. That's the problem. Oh, yeah. That was the biggest concern, though, John. Those, those problems could have been fixed because he didn't just have to cut it off. I mean, he could have just put a little bit more pressure. Like, look, what, let me explain from the very beginning. If someone's making large steps and large adjustments to the left and the right, when they're doing that, that means their body is floating a little bit too much to the left and the right, which means they're off balance for a longer duration of time than they should be, which means that I can step in at any moment as they start to move and capitalize with something. And attack. Knock them off balance. Not even if it has to be hard, whether it's a leg kick, whether it's a push in the face, whether it's a body shot, anything that will knock them off balance so I can land a two and a three. He was just letting him run around him. Oh, I know. And not making him pay for it. Not not hitting the low calf kick. Not anything that would make him make adjustments. And then when and then when he went down, I was just 
okay, let me just curl up. There was no chance. There was no thought of even getting no, an underhook or. Come on. Think about it, Josh. Buckley was postured up throwing not just one mm-hmm. hand. He was throwing both. Yeah. He's throwing and both. And nothing in return. Nothing to stop. Nothing to take him out of balance to, to put him in a position where he has to stop and, and you know, remain in that, oh, okay, I've got to, I, I need my balance to remain in the top position. Yeah. Nothing. I don't know. Strange. Don't know yeah, it is. But now yeah. Joaquin but, Buckley's going to be in the top 10? Oh, yeah. 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 Give me some. I mean, you take, a, you take a look, and, you know, he was already, you know, talking about, you know, he'll be there, and he didn't call anyone out, really. Waste of an opportunity. Chael Sonnen, yeah. waste of an opportunity. Yeah, Chael Sonnen would be mad. Absolutely waste <laughs> of an opportunity. <laughs> Um, if I'm going to look into these rankings here with him, well, Vicente was number 11, mm-hmm. so he's going to have to be somewhere within that 12, you know, 12, 11, 10 range somewhere. Yeah. I mean, let me see. Joaquin Buckley, who would you like to see him fight in there? Honestly, if I was going to see him fight some, uh, I'm now since he had to pull out of his last fight, Sean Brady. Uh, I was going to, I was thinking Sean as well. I know Jack Della Madalena has got a broken arm, so he's out for a bit. Yeah, he's out. You know, uh, Colby's talking about fighting Ian Gary. Uh, you know, I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, it makes for some fun fight. You know, you know who I'd want to see him fight, and I know he's not in the rankings here. But if he stays at 170, is Kevin uh, Kelvin Gastelum? Yeah, that'd be a fun be fight. Good. Kelvin good. kicks a little bit. Kelvin wrestles a little bit. Good guy. Right. He's got quick hands and good boxing. I wouldn't mind seeing that fight. Let's get Kelvin in that top ten. I know now. Look, Vicente or not Vicente, but uh, Buckley's got to give someone else out of the rankings a chance. You just got yours. You capitalized. Let's go. Give someone out of the rankings yep. a chance. If I, if I was the UFC, I'd be thinking, like, what fun fights could we put on for Joaquin Buckley? And that would be Kelvin Gaston would be the fight. Not bad. You know, the Not modern bad. day uh, Roberto Duran, as you like to call him. That's it. Yeah. That's, that's, that's my Roberto Duran of MMA. Next fight. Uh, ah, we had Chris Weidman <laughs> taking on Bruno Silva, and this just turned into an absolute mess. Shit show. Talk to me. Talk to me about what you John, saw. what the hell am I going to say, man? This is your fucking area of expertise. I mean, there were so many fuck-ups. Like, I can't even, like, begin. Well, yeah, well okay. You you said that you were on uh, Twitter. Twitter. What, what were you putting out? I didn't even see it. See, I was, I was screwing with the bulls today. You, so I, you, you, I think I was on Twitter last night about all this stuff. Uh, Look, well, you were texting me. Yeah, I was. I was texting you, and then I was tweeting right after you confirmed what I was thinking. I was thinking, what a shit show. But, John, it really just came down to um, I've been through the dealings of dealing with the athletic commission, you know, after the headbutt with Patricky and then the, the knockout with Patricky and all that stuff and having to deal with commissions. You know how difficult that it is to deal with them based on the fact they don't want to change whatever it is decision they decided to put on the fight because they don't want to set a precedent that things can be changed so easily. So in the situation last night, you've got Chris Weidman who had poked him in the eye earlier, and then poked. How, how many times? I want to say twice. Twice. Well, no, he poked him in the eye twice in one setting at the end. Okay. But two right. times before that, he had poked him in the eye. Correct. Uh, yeah. Okay. Four times. Um. So then, the fight ends up. He ends up poking him in the eye once with the right hand, then once with the left hand. And then, or sorry, once to the left hand, then once to the right, and then hits him with the little lefty hook. It kind of like clubs him a little bit, barely grazes yeah. him though, and puts him and down. And he goes down. Basically, yeah. he went down from but the two eye pokes. He's going down off of, I can't see. Off the two eye pokes. Yeah. Referee jumps in. Gary Copeland, who I have never met, I don't believe. I think I've seen him yeah. around, but I've never actually sat, introduced myself, and talked to him. And John, you know, I've, I like to talk to all the referees. I like to poke yeah, fun at you them. Do. Uh, even with the judges, I like to poke fun at them. I always try to tell the referees and the and the judges right before the fight, John, it's the line that I, I love to use them. Hey guys, my line. Good luck tonight. Don't fuck it up. Don't fuck it up. Okay. <laughs> and they love it is your line. I've stole it from you, but now I just do it every chance and opportunity I get. When I pass them in the hallways, I get it a chance. Don't fuck it up tonight. Well, um, Gary Copeland fucked it up. But did he fuck it up? Because it comes now the way that the fight was ruled, 
it's basically back on to the commission who well, made this decision. Hold on. When, when, when the whole thing happened right away, mm -hmm. I texted you and I said, this is what they need to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and it's, it is what they needed to do. Well, explain explain to us what, what they did. So then, uh, so what you had is you had Gary Copeland. Uh, he calls the fight. When Chris Weidman is on top, there like was this. the eye poke. Yep. You see those hands go up. That, that fight is over, and he is calling the fight, and he is saying that it is his uh, opinion. The fighter it cannot intelligently defend themselves. I am stopping the fight. This is a TKO. That's The problem with it was there was a foul that led to Bruno Silva going down. And there was. He got poked in, the, he got poked in both eyes. Mm -hmm. Let's just be honest. I'll, I'm going to put it on you know, Gary in in certain ways. Certain uh, fights, you know, can be a problem. When certain when shows are a problem, it's telling you either you've got to change what you're doing as that official, or you're getting older, you're getting slower, and your decision making is not quite as good. And you know, I've I've said it many times before. You you can stay in there as a fighter too long. You can stay in as an official too long, you know, and, and you, you owe it upon uh, the sport. You owe it upon fighters to make the decision of when it's time to say, okay, it's my time to step out. And uh, everyone, you know, when you get there, you want to do it because you feel like you're part of something and it's, it's awesome to be there. I totally understand that. But in this situation, when Gary Copeland is, has Chris Weidman, who is putting his fingers out, Josh, he's, he's extending his fingers out like it, it's a pitchfork. You need to address that as the official. I don't care that you're in New Jersey where Chris Weidman is a hero. I, look, I'm being honest. I wanted Chris Weidman to win this fight. I think you wanted Chris Weidman to win this fight. I absolutely did want Chris Weidman to win this fight. Okay. But I can't have Chris Weidman getting preferential treatment as far as you're the one that's creating this problem. You know, instead of just saying, oh, it's an eye poke, you know, let me get him a towel and stuff like that. You need to address the problem and make sure that the individual who is creating the problem doesn't do it anymore. Well, he did do it more. I don't think Gary saw the uh, eye pokes. And so that was understandable. Mm -hmm. He makes the call of stopping the fight. Once he makes the call of stopping that fight there and they look at the tape, you can see that he did get poked in the eye. Here's the difference Twice. for everyone. So they understand what. When I was texting you, I'm saying, look, they need to have the judges score whatever part of the third round they've seen. Mm -hmm. Who won that round? You already have two rounds that have been judged. This needs to go to a technical decision. It's not a unanimous decision victory. It's a technical decision victory for Chris Weidman. I, I knew that, you know, they were, let's be honest, Chris had won the first two rounds. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're going to say the third round, I think Chris was winning that one for the most part too. So I knew Chris was going to win the fight, but that way it's not on the fact that a foul occurred and the referee made a decision to stop it without seeing the foul. Now we're saying, okay, we see the foul. And this is what we do based upon, upon the fact that the fight had entered the third round. You can go to a technical decision. If the same thing had happened in the second round, it would have ended up being a no contest. You would not have had a technical decision because they can only go to that technical decision if the fight enters the third round. It did enter the third round. They were able to take the first two rounds of scores and the third round from the judges, and that's why Chris Weidman was awarded a unanimous decision victory that's called a technical decision. So what the commission is doing is relieving themselves of any responsibility whatsoever in changing this. Is that technically what, what's going on? No, it's not, well, you say relieving themselves. What they're doing is by going to that technical decision, it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to tell you straight out because – giving Chris Weidman a victory off of TKO, then you're saying that you're not addressing the fact mm -hmm. that there was a foul. They are addressing the fact Gary Coleman could, I, I, did I say Gary? You did say Gary, Gary Coleman. Gary Copeland 
I know Gary Copeland could have decided to have taken points for the fouls. He didn't do that. That's on Isn't Gary Coleman decision. facts of life. Yeah, it was. <laughs> I was like, wait, I had to think back. I'm like, that well, name for sure. They're both, they're both very short. Yes, they are. And very <laughs> thick also. Thick too. So Gary Copeland could have <laughs> decided to take points. He didn't do that. That's that's his decision. Gary fucking Coleman. <laughs> I'm sorry, John. And, <laughs> and so that's why I said, I said, did I say Coleman? What you talking about, Willis? <laughs> so yeah, exactly. So when you have it that the commission actually did the right thing mm -hmm. but yes by doing that right thing they are taking the ability of bruno silva to protest the stopping of the fight as a tko and making it a no contest later on they're taking that away by doing the right thing saying nope there was a foul <laughs> we're going to go to the scorecards based upon this end of the third round and chris wyman gets the technical decision can I ask you a question? With that ruling, though, what's to stop fighters from accidentally poking people in the eyes when they know they've won the first two rounds? <laughs> I'm just throwing it out there, John. I'm being honest. Well, first off, you know, if you, you sit here and you look and you go, you know, what what stops someone from biting? Well, that's a, but the thing is, the difference is the difference is no, one is on. the, the, you're doing it on the, purpose, and I'm saying I could accidentally quotations by the way. Okay, for you listeners on Spotify <clears throat> and iTunes, is I can quotations poke you in the eye and you can't continue. I win if yeah. you go to the judges' scorecards. Okay, could, it could be, or it could be that the the referee looks and says, "I think you did that intentionally." I'm taking two points, and now we go to the scorecards, and you lose. <clears throat> I understand what you're so. saying. I do get that, but I'm saying we know in this day and age. I mean, Justin Gaethje came out I was like, "Oh, look, another eye poke from these shitty ass UFC gloves." Well, that was very uh, that was very okay, brave by just. I want you to think it. about this. If you take a look, I'm being. You can take a look at different promotions and the the gloves that they mm -hmm. use. Take a look at bare knuckle boxing. How many eye pokes do you see in bare knuckle boxing? Yeah, you don't. You don't. The glove that the UFC has had for a long time, you know, when they went to the century glove, they their eye pokes increased exponentially mm. from it because it is a fact that you have to work <clears throat> to squeeze your hand instead of it naturally kind of forming and you having to work to extend your hands. It should be that mm. there's a, such a curve that your fingers are almost <clears throat> cupped by just being, you know, relaxed inside of that glove. They're not. Yeah. They're, that glove mm. makes your hand, and you know exactly yeah. what I'm talking about. You fought in these gloves. It it makes your hand accentuate to where your fingers are straight out. Yeah, absolutely. I don't blame They're, Justin for saying it. The best gloves I think I've ever fought in, there was two. Uh, for me, it was the Strike Force gloves, but then there was a lot of broken hands in those gloves. Yeah, the, because those were the Fairtex gloves. Yep. They're very, they're very uh, they were cut down on the sides. Mm -hmm which was great for grappling. Oh, I loved it. Uh, they didn't have quite as much protection. They had more more, more protection in the, in the, wrist. the wrist area yeah. stuff. But, uh, but they were great as far as they did cup your hands. Um, yeah, and then the Pride ones. Pride and, and Dream when I fought in Dream as well. So Pride yeah, and Dream thing. both were the same glove. glove. Rise, Rise, Rise now and has same, those same gloves. They're cupped. And I, the early Bellator ones were that way as well. Yeah, the Everlast, Everlast made a glove for Bellator that was a really good glove that was it was curved. No padding in the front of the knuckle whatsoever. No. The greatest oh, gloves yeah. ever. I mean, <laughs> I had no pop, so I had to get any advantage I could. Uh, uh, John, as fans and as people at home, I'm going to say this, um, but this is something I stole from Stephanie Haynes. And I got to be honest, her and I, we used to work together, not work together. We did a lot of interviews early in my career when I was with Strike Force. We were, we, we've been friends for a long time. I haven't talked to her in years, but as of the 2019, 2018, all this stuff with all the politics stuff, I, we don't really see eye to eye on a lot of things, but I want to be honest though. I got a lot of respect for her. I, this is what I want to say is she made a good point as a fan and as, as people that are hardcore, like you and I were talking about this a second ago, we wanted Chris Weidman to win, Yeah, but she brought up a good point. 
if their positions were reversed, Chris would be bitching right now. There would be no end to it. But because it's him, and we've all felt bad for him for a while now, we're supposed to just ignore this, his egregious fouling and say, good job, you earned it. Nope. That's quote, by the way. End quote. Um, yeah. Are we kind of on that? Because I got to be honest, you can't just turn your back. This is what Chris well, said. Chris Wyman said. That's what Chris said. You got to you got to point out. This me, is what Chris said. This is what Chris said. You can't just turn your not, back. It was not a good look. And fall to the ground every time your eyeball feels poked. Chris Wyman questions if Bruno was looking for a way out in the controversial end of their UFC Atlantic uh, Atlantic City fight. You can't, you can't say that. That's like look, he legit got poked in the eye. Yeah. But I'm going to go back up to what Stephanie said, or Steffi said, was that, are we in that, in that area right now of that we have all felt bad for Chris? He's gone through a lot. He's been in a slump, had, you know, like been a lot of ups and downs. He was in Atlantic City. We wanted him to get the win. You and I talked about, we wanted him to get the win. It's a big yeah. moment for him. Are we just supposed to just brush it under the rug? Just sweep it under the rug because because it was Chris Wyman and it was in Atlantic City and the the bottom line is John it should have it should have been rolled in no contest. No, no, okay, no, and, and and this is I I told you if that scenario had you know there's rules and you've got to follow the rules of the sport and when I say no I'm saying it because. Like I pointed out, if that had happened in the second round, mm -hmm. even at you know four minutes and fifty nine seconds of the second round, it would have been a no contest. Mm. The athletic commission would have advised uh, Copeland, "Hey, he got his eye poked. Make a decision what it's going to be," and Copeland would have ended up calling it uh, no contest. Got it. But when it enters the third round. And you have a fight that has had two rounds scored, and you can score a portion of that third round. The rules will tell you, hey, go to that instead of calling it a no contest. Go to the judge's decision, make it a technical decision. And mm -hmm. that's what they did. So it's the right, it is the right move. People may not like it. And the real fact of why they don't like it is exactly what she's saying is people look at it like, well, Chris Wyman, you you poked him in the eyes how many times? Yeah, and you got to win, and then you're saying that he gave up. Well, you're poking him in the eyes. You're, you're using fouls, mm -hmm. and I can understand where people don't like that. Like, here's the you know when you when you look at this, like we said, I was rooting for Chris. Mm -hmm. I wanted Chris to win because he hadn't had a win in a long time. You know, based upon you know he 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 had that one uh, against I, I can't think of the guy from uh, when he came back and came up short. Yeah, and then he he, you know, he just had the last one that was against Tavares, and you're looking, and you know he has his kids there and his family, and you go, man, I just want him to get you know, get a win so you know you can say goodbye. And I look at it, Josh, and people are not only you know not saying you know, hey that that'll that should be his last fight. They're all saying Chris Weidman's back, Chris Weidman, you know, well title hopes. I saw title hopes, Josh, how? I mean, I, I don't, I don't understand, you know. And the, again, I don't want to, you know, disperse Bruno Silva at all, but it's not like he got, you know, a, you know, a top ten contender that he he got a win over. Uh, I just look at it. And it's like I hope, you know, I, and I'm not saying it's gonna happen. I would like to see Chris Wyman do something, you know, else in the sport. Now I think he's great for the sport, but I don't want to see him continue to fight because I don't want to see, you know, damage done to him. Can we go back to like, I want to go back to the ruling. You said like, okay, in the third round, you go to the judges scorecards. Look, shouldn't it be kind of ruled as if like the guy who didn't make weight can't win the title, but can still fight. Shouldn't it be like that? Like if you're the guy that did well, the foul in the third round, can. hold on. So let me, let me give you the difference between what's being called accidental and what's being called intentional. If I call you, if you, if you're fighting, or we'll we'll just say I'm sorry. Let's let's talk about this fight with Chris and uh, Bruno. We'll say that Gary Copeland had called one of, you know, the the eye pokes. He said, "No, 
you know, there was intent behind that. I had told you, don't extend your fingers. You did it, you know, right away. You know, that's intentional. I'm going to sit here and now take points. At that point, you have an intentional foul committed in the fight. And if the fighter can continue on, we're going to restart the fight. But if the fight ends off of that same foul, meaning the foul, it's the, 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 we'll say it's a cut or something like that. It enlarges. Okay. You cannot, or Bruno Silva could not lose the fight based upon that. He can't, Chris Wyman can't win the fight and Bruno Silva cannot lose it. Bruno Silva can win the fight. But if it comes down to the fight being stopped off of that, you know, injury, so we'll say an eye poke again, I poke to the same eye, that's the same injury, then it would, there is, if there has been called intentional, he cannot lose based upon that foul. Does that make sense? No, it makes perfect sense. I'm just, I'm going back to, he's already committed two eye pokes earlier in the fight. Whether they were ruled intentional or not, it was non-intentional. Accidental. Yeah. Then you get into the, the third round, and now you have two eye pokes at the same exchange that lead to you getting the win. Yes. We, well, okay, again, this all comes down to how did Gary Copeland rule the foul? He, as the referee, he's the one, he is the sole arbiter of this fight. He's the one saying, I say it's intentional. Or I say it was unintentional. If he said it was intentional, there's no way for Chris Weidman to win the fight. If he says it's unintentional, there's a way for Chris Weidman to win the fight. Does that? No, it makes perfect want, sense. I'm just saying, how many unintentional eye pokes are we going to give and still give the guy the fight? That, that that's the part I can't. You know, that, that's why I'm that's why I'm going with this. That's, I, I'm that's why to, people are upset. I'm not right playing. Now, I'm not playing devil's advocate. That exact yeah. that exact thing is you know what you're saying is what she was saying in her tweet, and that's why people are upset. Is they're looking and going, man, how many eye pokes can there be? And there's and he's just awarded the win. Well, it's based upon all of these decisions that were made. There's there's a route for you to go with those decisions. You make a different decision, there's a different route. I'm going into the third round with now two eye pokes. I'm just I keep going through this. I'm like that's that's why I feel no. I feel like if he did like if, as if a fighter didn't make weight, they can't win the title. You shouldn't be allowed if you've had several eye pokes before. You get into the third round and then two eye pokes to finish the fight. There's just got to be common sense used. And like, hey, like the guy's obviously damaged four four times, three times with eye pokes. And that, that was the leading sequence to the end of the fight. I get going to the judge's scorecard. I get all that. But this this had a direct out, outcome on the fight. Like it just, the fight didn't just end because, oh, he got hit with a clean shot. And I put like, no, 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 no. Like they didn't break get a second and then come back and then an exchange happened. He got knocked out. Okay. So let's get, let's right now, Dave did a great job. He put up the scorecards for Uh this, which with all of them being 30, 27 across the board for Chris Weidman, every round Weidman gets 10, Silva gets nine. So now let's, for instance, say, like I was telling you, Weidman cannot win the fight. If it was called an intentional eye poke. Okay, based upon the technical decision, the best that Chris Weidman can come out with in that situation is a draw. The worst he can come out with is a loss for Bruno Silva. If it was ruled intentional, the best he can come out with is a win. The worst he can come out with is a draw. Okay, if it was called intentional. So we'll say in the third round that Gary had called it intentional. So instead of all the judges are still going to score the the third round for what they see it as, which is a 10, nine Weidman, but we'll say that he called it intentional. If you have an intentional foul and there is injury, you must deduct a minimum of two points, a minimum. Mm. So he doesn't have a choice of, of making it one point. He has to do two or more. Normally, they're going to take the two. They're not going to go more. 
So you take the two points away from Weidman, meaning that in the round number three, he gets eight while Silva gets nine, meaning 28 to 27, Chris Mike Weidman would have been the person with the better score and the, the fight would have been deemed a draw. <clears throat> I get everything you're saying, man. You're making my brain. No, I know. Here. And I'm you just, just you just, just overloaded me at the very <laughs> end there with all this back and forth. But the bottom line That's... to me is, I feel like the commission, being the commission, should step in and say, "Look, we've had plenty of eye pokes in this fight. The lead, the the final sequence was because of two eye pokes back to back. Common sense should say this is a no contest. That, I mean, it like, well, just, it would have been a draw. Yeah, it, yeah. If they did it the right way. Yeah. It would have been Chris Weidman comes out on top 29 28, as far as well, 28 27, mm -hmm. excuse me, 28 27, and in the score. But based upon there being what they say, well, okay, it's intentional. If they called it that, which I'm not saying it was, I'm not saying Chris tried to do no. it, but if they you know, used that, it would have been a draw based on the, the fact that he can't win after committing an intentional foul. That the ad injury ends up stopping the fight. We both wanted Chris to win. We don't think Chris did it on purpose. I'm from my side no. as a fighter, and if I just tip put myself in those shoes, going if I got poked in the eye four times, more or less, whatever it is, and the finishing sequence was two eye pokes in a row back to back, I'd be a little upset, and I'd be a little upset too hearing my opponent, the one that did the eye poking, going, "Oh, you just can't turn your back and do that, and do this." doesn't work that way man like sometimes yeah. just take the take the w and just go hey man this is the game i don't make the rules i know it was a shitty situation to be in but it is what it is and you know i worked out i was one in the fight that's all you can say yeah this it, yeah just a bad look a bad look but I, i'm a big fan of chris weidman but this goes back to john what we talk about they all they want to do is get that one win and now people are talking about title runs because bruno silva had a know. good fight against alice perher he, oh, he had a good fight with him, and he did this to this guy. He's a tough guy. I get it, but he's not even in the top 15. Like, yeah. what, what, what are we talking about? Bro, you're 40 years old. I got a lot of love for you. I'm glad that you came back. I think this is a big, it's a big deal. Okay, you look good in that fight. Yeah. You look good. Yeah. Uh, but, but he did. Let's, okay, let's be honest. Fighters chasing that last W, get it, and then now they're going to chase it until it's an L again. Exactly. Just gotta gotta know when it's time, man. Gotta know That's when it's time. That's the problem. Yeah. Ah, for, okay. Next fight. Sorry, we 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 beat that shit to death. <laughs> All right. We had Ruzaboyev against Dumas, Gosh. and it was another eye poke. <laughs> yeah, dude, it was. Oh. Let's just be honest. Look at Ruzaboyev is. I told you, hey, he's good. I've seen him fight. He finished his fights, but this was a. Mm -hmm. It was an eye poke. Yeah, you know, that's what ended up leading it to almost in the same direction. You didn't have them, you know, with the the eye pokes in the beginning, but what finished the fight was the fact that he got poked in the eye. Well, I mean, we can't we can't blame Gary Copeland for this fight, but we can't. <laughs> but, but you and I were texting during this situation as well. I'm a big fan of Shallow Ribeiro, and him and I were supposed to fight several times uh, over in Dream. I believe it was Dream at the time. Uh, we were supposed to fight over there. Never came to fruition. But the bottom line is, is I'm a big fan of his. We were supposed to do a grappling match against each other. I am encouraged by fighters being refs. But like you had pointed out, and I had seen, because um, he did the main event as well, putting himself yeah. in situations where he's not in the best position to view the fight. Yeah. I, I You know, and I, I'm not going to say, I, I love Shaolin. He's a great person. Uh, I, I refed his fights. But there's mechanics to being a fighter and there's mechanics to being a referee. And I don't know uh, who taught uh, Shaolin the basics of referee, but someone Probably left Herb things Dean. out. Something, <laughs> so, well, someone left things out. That, that was a jab at her, by the way, on my part. He, allow, <laughs> he allows himself to be put out of position yeah. all of the time. And I, I, you, you said, yeah, I'd really like I said, yeah. I like him too, but man, he's just out of position. He's out of position. He's out of position. And uh, 
this was one of the ones you know you can see it in the different fights you know you you don't as a fighter if you're if your feet are stuck in the mud you're probably gonna end up having a hard time in the fight if a referee if your feet are stuck in the mud you know it doesn't mean you have to be moving all the time mm-hmm. but you got to be moving when it's necessary agree and there's points where it's necessary agree uh next fight Oh, Kyle Nelson against Bill Algio. <laughs> this was another one you didn't like from Gary Copeland. I know. You know, this one was, it's one of those, I understand it. And I understand what, you know, Gary's doing. But you're right. Hold on. I'm not going to sit here. And- I'm shaking my head no. And John's trying to make sure that he's he understands where I'm at. He knows. <laughs> we were texting back and forth during this fight. And I was fucking pulling my hair out. But go ahead. Yeah. Well, you know, first off, I'm I'm going to be honest and say it. I don't like, you know, I hate late stoppages. Late stoppages are worse than early stoppages to me based upon the health and safety of the fighter. But I don't want to see the early stoppage either. And the the one thing I want to say in this is, as a referee, many times you'll get guys that they're looking for the... They don't want the fighter to receive any undue damage, Okay any what we call unnecessary damage and bill algio was being hurt in this fight but he was still fighting Mm -hmm. bill algio is a professional fighter bill algio is a guy who gets paid to go out there and put it on the line and he loves doing that and that's what has made him who he is and he's had fights in the ufc where he's been in trouble oh yeah and you have got to allow him to make it either through those situations or when the situation comes where he can no longer intelligently defend himself, when he has swam into such deep water that he starts to drown, that you don't allow him to to take the unnecessary damage. That's your job. But as an official, you cannot keep someone from being damaged. I say it too many times. They're going to get damaged. It's their job. I know that sucks to say. I know it doesn't sound good. They are professional fighters. They will be damaged. You're not going to stop it. You stop it when it is unnecessary damage. And Bill Algio, he was hurt. I'm not saying he wasn't, but he was still fighting. I'm going to, I'll go to another fight that was down the, you know, the card and, and show you the difference. Bill Algio was on his feet. He was still fighting. You can go down the card and look one more, go a little bit farther. And you can look at the Anton Tricali versus Asla fight. That was actually a good stoppage by Gary Copeland. Yes. Tricali went down, his hands went back, and he was resting on his hands with his head up because he couldn't get himself out of that position. He was that hurt, and he was only going to be receiving unnecessary damage. He stopped the fight. It was a good call by Gary Copeland. I agree. The one for the one for Algio, it's a little bit fast. Scroll back up, Dave, to the Algio. Like, what, go ahead. I'll let you say what you want. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry about that. I'm no, about no. Um, John, there's. First off, let me just let me just preface the whole thing by saying this: I am always on the side of the fighter safety. Always. But I am also always on the side of making sure that that fighter has every opportunity to come back and win the fight. And for those of you guys, and I know this was on a way smaller scale, Jamal Emmers and Nate Landwehr. Landwehr got oh hurt God, yeah. early in that oh, yeah. fight. And what a fight. What a it fight. It was a great fight. The greatest fights, a lot, I would say a lot of the greatest fights are back and forth are back and forth and should have been probably stopped at some moments could have could have been yeah and probably should have been sometimes let's look at the diego corrales fight the greatest fight in history sorry boxing yes you take that against castillo you take that fight that fight could have been stopped at any moment at any moment but no you let those fighters do what they have been training their body to do for their whole life and in this in this situation, Algio, I know he was taking shots. And every fighter, oh, well, he was he was he was taking them. It was gonna end up bad for him. You don't know. You don't know, just like I don't know. No. I no. have no idea what the outcome is gonna be. Just like you don't know. 
So let's not sit up here on our fucking high horse and say that, oh, he was going to get knocked out. We don't want to see him get hurt. We don't want to see him get knocked. You have no clue. Just like me. I have no clue. And at that moment, sure, he was taking some shots, but he was still moving away. He was still trying to put his hands up. He was still being a defensive fighter. And I didn't like seeing him get hit. I didn't like him getting clobbered. But he was still moving his head a little bit. He was still keeping the arms away. He was still moving his feet trying to get away. Those are all moments of trying to be a defensive fighter. Am I right or am I wrong, John? You're absolutely right. Gosh, man, I love hearing you say that. Okay, but the bottom... (laughs) It's tough. I mean, it's tough when you're the official. Again, you're concerned about people taking too many shots and you pull the trigger just a little bit fast and you, and you, I mean, someone, someone had just put a thing out on, on Twitter that showed a, a fight of Tony Ferguson's that I did against Lando Venata. Oh, and that was, fuck. that's a perfect example, example of this perfect example of this fight. It, it It is. And when you look at it, it's a fact of, you know, Tony Ferguson was absolutely the favorite going into that fight. Lando Venata was a guy who was a, uh, a last minute replacement. 10 days. Yeah. Sioux and Falls, South Dakota. I was there. Front row. Boom. There you go. Exactly. And you, know, Lando Venata had him in trouble. He was falling over, you know, and I let it go. And, and But why did I let it go? Because it's Tony fucking Ferguson. That's why well, you let that I, I, shit go. Exactly. It is, it's Tony Ferguson, and Tony is trying. Yeah. He's trying. He, I'm not saying he's not getting, he's not taking shots. He's trying to do something to get himself back in this fight. And you, you got to give him that. That's again, you know, Tony's uh, win streak would have ended somewhere around six or seven, mm-hmm. but it went to 12. If, you know, if I had stopped that fight on him, you know, he came back and he won that fight and he won it because he's Tony fucking Ferguson. He was tough as hell. Yeah. That was after my fight. He fought. He, I think he was the next fight after I fought him. So I think that was like eight or nine. He was somewhere in the nine category. I think eight or nine, but the bottom, here's the thing. It comes down to this though, too, as a referee, and we, we've had this conversation multiple times. How much research goes into you roughing each fight? You have to know each one of these fighters and what they're capable of. You should. Bill Algio. It's one of the problems. It's one of the problems that I will say with, you know, uh, commissions is they want to hide all that. They want to hide what fights you're going to be doing. You have no idea until you show up at the arena. Stupid. What fights you're going to be doing unless it is a fight, uh, we'll say a championship fight in Nevada. That usually goes before the commission. So they'll say who's going to be the referee, who's going to be the judges on a championship fight. So you'll know you're doing that one fight, but absolutely. You know, I always looked into, it's the job of the referee to know these guys, know where they're good, know where they're strong, know where they are weak, know how their abilities to recover. And and everyone's got different ones and you see the way that they do things. And so you got to play within those parameters. You have to, because it's the only way that you can give the fighter, the true, you know, time that, they deserve possibly in this fight until there comes that point where they're starting to drown. Okay. Get them out of the fight. I go back to some of the greatest fights in history could have, or should have been stopped early, but they weren't. I mean, you look at Justin Gaethje when he made his debut in the UFC, Michael Johnson, against Michael Johnson, that fight could have been stopped. Yeah. I could have stopped it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it could have been, but you didn't. And that's what we ended up with the, one of the greatest fights I've ever seen. Yeah. Bat well, knockdown, down, drag out. Great. And fight. so you, you look at that and people are like, well, you know, you know, I, one of the things, Justin Gaethje at, at the end of that fight, you know, I'm talking to him and I said, I said, I said, hey, great job. I said, you were really hurt in that fight. He goes, I never got hurt, you know? <laughs> and I go, you need to go watch yeah. it, you know, because he doesn't remember it, but man, you know, twice he was, you know, doing the funky stanky leg dance and stuff, it, you know, it could have been stopped, could have, but you can't take that away because he's hurt in that position. Yes, he's hurt. No doubt about it, but I can't sit here and say that, oh, he doesn't have a chance of collecting himself and bringing himself back in this fight. I've got to give him that chance because he's showing me he's trying and that's the whole thing you know when i used to go in the back and talk to fighters look as long as you are trying you're trying to either stop 
what your opponent is doing. You're trying to slow down what they're attacking you with. You're trying to be offensive. You're trying to move, get it, get away. I will let it go. It's when you don't do those things and you just stop and you just start accepting punishment, kind of like what we were talking mm-hmm. about with Vicente Luque. You're asking me to stop the fight and I'm going to stop yeah. it. The same thing went through with the uh, with Anthony Rumble Johnson's last fight. Yeah. When he fought um Gugu. Gugu. I can't remember. Gusto. His, yeah, Gusto. Yeah. Um, Jose Augusto. Yep. He's like, I wasn't hurt. <laughs> like he's yeah, then he know, sees the replay. I, he's like, I knew that, you know, oh, yeah, shit, unfor- was- un- unfortunately, you know, and, and see that was one of those, and I knew. I knew because I was the dumbass that, you know, asked him the question. And it was one of those ones that Norty. You know, to, you know, ask him how hurt he was. He's our producer. He's he our t- producer in our he, ear. He tells me in my ear, and I'm thinking, that's a bad question, Norty. <laughs> and I should have just gone with, that's a bad question. So, uh, you know, my, my producer wants to know, okay, you know, hey, how are we? I wasn't hurt at all. I was like, I knew it. <laughs> Jesus, what an idiot. Here I we am. go. Let's see the replay. Yeah. He's like, well, I'm shit, John, I didn't know I was hurt until you just showed me that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But I love it, man, because AJ played it off like, hey, man, it's real. I didn't know. No, I didn't yeah, know. I didn't I know. And he didn't. Yeah. You know, and that's the that's whole funny. thing. Guys don't. They don't. You know, those are moments that are never going to be part of their lives. Mm-hmm. They'll see it now, you know, later on. But at the moment, they don't have any memory of that at all. Mm-mm. You know what's funny? I never had any moments like that in any of my fights where I kind of just blacked out and don't remember the fights. I know there was pieces of the the Tony Ferguson fight. Yeah. I remember getting rocked, but I still remember pretty much a lot of the fight. I remember fighting out of the Kimura. I remember yeah, all these things. I remember in the third in the third round, almost potentially getting his back. I remember him grabbing the fence three times. I remember these things, right? But like, there was never moments I think in any of my fights. What like, about the Patricky fight? No, pretty much. Do, do, I remember do, everything. I remember the clash of heads. I remember every, I remember getting back up to my feet. So I, and, and I'm asking, I, I, I know you know it now, mm-hmm. but at the time of the fight, oh yeah, when it ended, when it ended, you knew right away, oh man, my, my our heads clash. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because okay. I remember. No, I, I, I want to know because a lot of times guys won't. Oh no, I remember when I we clashed heads and I fell to the ground. I looked up and I saw you circling around. I thought you made eye contact with me, but you didn't. Because I was like <laughs> looking for you to like, hey, it was a headbutt, dude. And But yeah. you were, you, you didn't. You were. Yeah. You can't see it. No, so I just kept fighting. I was like, all right, whatever. I got back up and then it just was no, no, no bueno. No mas. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go. I'm going to skip over the Chidi and Chikawani fight. Not a great performance yeah. by either guys, uh, no. Reese McKee. But boy, I don't know how that was a split decision. Mm. <laughs> just, just like, okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it just, yeah. Uh, Nate 30, Landwehr. 30 27 on two cards. 29 28 the other way on another. Jeez. I mean, look, yeah. John, but when the fights are, I mean, like, it wasn't close. I, I, I had Chidi winning, but. Yeah, but it just wasn't. It wasn't like neither one of them did much. No, enough to really make not, me feel like it wasn't okay. a great fight. Yeah, so and you know, like, I but mean, let's talk about the fight before it because it goodness. was a great fight. Was a great it fight. was the fight of the night. Yeah, it was the longest first round I've ever seen. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was one of those fights where you're like, shit, we're still in the first round. These guys are oh, still banging it out, dude. I'll tell you what. You know, we talked about you know Nate Landwehr. Mm-hmm. As before, when we were talking about these fights coming up and said, Hey, you know, this dude, he's just, you know, you talk about a dog, you talk about a guy that's there to fight. Mm-hmm. You know, he doesn't have all the skills of everyone else. And I'm going to be honest, you know, Jamal Emmers was lighting him up because he's a more technical, you know, longer, faster fighter, heart and balls, dude, heart and balls goes a long ways. Yep. And Nate Landwehr's got fucking a shitload of both. Because man, he just gutted that out, and he just uh, he gets into that the you know dirty boxing is an absolute art form, and get, there's people that are good at it, and there's people that are not. But being able to be in that dirty boxing range and hold on to someone and hit Nate Landwehr is good at it. He takes over in the fights there. Jamal Emmers is the more technical striker. He's got the better footwork, all of it. But it was a guy being able to take all of those shots, the elbow to the head, you know, which opened up a nice gash on him. And when he got into the clinch and that dirty boxing, it was the difference maker for him. 
it's he he understood what he had to do as he realized the first minute and a half, two minutes, being on the outside wasn't working for him. Being able to try to work his way in wasn't working for him. He had to crush the space, fight him in a phone booth, and make him uncomfortable. And that's exactly what Nate did. He just tried to put so much pressure <clears throat> and get himself to the clinch. Emmers, once he started getting pressured too much, he decided to stand and and defend his territory. That was his downfall. Once they got into like an exchange, I think about two, almost three minutes in into the first round, once they almost got into that three minutes, they got into a big exchange. And you can see out of that exchange, Emmers backs away and his arms just drop and his shoulders drop and he looked exhausted. The speed was gone. The footwork was gone. And I was like, oh shit, he's in trouble. Right away, I knew as he's in trouble. Unless he starts getting on his bike right now, which he was showing no signs of, he was just, hey, I'm going to pot shot you now, one, two. And Nate Lanover is like, I'm just getting warmed up, son. Okay, I'm mm -hmm. coming for you. <clears throat> and that's exactly what happened. So that was a gritty, gutsy performance by Nate Lanover. And just overall, just I mean, like, those are the kind of fights that, <clears throat> that you'll be talking about for a long time. And the reason uh, being. Absolutely. Is because the ref didn't stop it early. Okay, thanks, yeah. thanks, Keith Peterson. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next fight. Ah, we have Jandaroba against Lupita Godinez. I man, I thought Godinez was going to actually get the better of this fight, but it did not happen. It was the the grittiness of Jandaroba. She's just she is a a. a solid competitor that just continues to just press what she does yeah you know she'll throw you because she let's be honest her stand-up is you know basic one two yeah you know one two one two she'll every now and then she'll throw a kick and i thought godina's was gonna you know start to really just turn it on she wasn't able to you know it was a close fight it was a good fight but uh i don't know Jandaroba is, seems like she's in that position in the straw weight. She's right at that where she can beat just about everyone, but she's not she's not going to beat the very best ones. She's also in a position where even when she does just about beat everyone, it could go either way. Yeah. And that's what we saw last night like I didn't look at it as like it was a unanimous decision, but it was like one big shot or two big shots yeah. and the fight could have changed the you know changed Absolutely. the other direction. Yeah. Um, the, it re, she reminds and nothing against this is my boy, but it's very she, people fight her the same way people fought Jake Shields. Yeah, very similar, mm -hmm. but, but they're very similar fighters. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a great comparison as far as you know. Jake just didn't have that stand up that you look at and you go, "Wow, he just you know he he moves well. He's you know he throws beautiful combinations." <laughs> I mean, every time Jake was in the stand-up, you were like, God. You cringed. Yeah. But you did. But you look at how GSP walked away from that fight. He was busted up. Oh, I know. And you're like, how did that happen with Jake Shields? Like <laughs> you look and it's like, I don't recall Jake touching him that no, much. But he, he did. does. He does. Yeah. I've sparred with Jake. Jake was one of my main sparring partners for a lot of my fights uh in the strike force days, especially after I fought Gilbert. Uh, the first time Jake would come in all the time and spar with me. He was a fantastic training partner. I'd grapple with him all the time. He is fantastic on the ground. His grappling, his grappling is, is phenomenal, freaking unbelievable. But his striking is very underestimated because it's a jab one two. It's a jab jab cross, and then he follows it with that body kick, same leg lead leg body kick every single time. And mm. it doesn't seem like it lands hard, but it's enough to really throw you off your rhythm. And his jab is stiff enough to snap your head back. So it throws off what you're what you're trying to do. With Jen Robo, she's just I think the females are so afraid of getting taken down that the shots it's, land and then the wrestling either chums in. But it's one of those when you when you watch Jen Robo, you watch, you know, Jake. How is it that somebody that is that fluid on the ground? <laughs> with body positioning and everything that they do, and they can just flow from one technique to the next. And you put them on their feet, and they look like they have two they left are, feet. Yeah, 
it's just it's one of those man okay i i understand it i, I just don't understand it <laughs> it's john it's crazy. very it's very rare that i've met wrestlers high caliber wrestlers <laughs> excuse me that are able to adapt to the striking yeah john fitch you know josh koscheck yeah. i mean like he had good striking but it wasn't great it was a world class you know yeah. what i mean <clears throat> um big he had power in his hands i can tell you that uh you know but then there was he's strong he's a strong dude yeah he's physically just explosive and strong super fast with the hands but you know what i mean like there's i've met a lot of world-class wrestlers mike van arsdale no striking yeah. you know yeah. randy couture very minimal striking no basic dan henderson not great striking just big power that's you know there's i'm talking about like quality he, he, he had the h bomb factor yeah like he, he know, didn't have like, great striking he just had power no. yeah. it was like th hurt, think about that you think, one shot. think about the hector lombard knockout with the back elbow you think he planned that <coughs> shit like oh that's not yeah. my practice oh, every day yeah. in the gym I've been practicing that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> shut up dude like dan and i've been friends for a long time since 96 nine, somewhere around yeah. there Come on, man! That guy, like, Dude, he, he's one of the he's one of the good guys out of the oh, sport. Absolutely, but he was blessed with God given strength absolutely. and power that it was an equalizer. You know, it didn't it didn't take you know it didn't take him landing a clean shot. He could land a shot that grazed and it hurt people. So jealous. <laughs> 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 All right, next fight. This is another Gary Copeland fuck up. I mean, I'm, I'm going to go in on this one a little bit. Oh, look. I'm not going to go in. It. I'm not going to go in on it too much. I mean, bottom no, line is Herbert Burns lost the fight. He didn't lose the fight uh, because of what Gary Copeland did. But it doesn't help, though, John. Look, he got he he need uh, Julio Arce into, uh, into the nuts. And then he turned around and did it again right away. The second time wasn't even, it wasn't so bad to where even Arce was like looking to stop the fight. He was still fighting. Gary stepped in to stop it and then took the point. If the fighter doesn't react, like, are we stopping these fights because we saw it? Like, who, what are we supposed to, like, in refs, are you guys supposed to stop it if you see it? And even if the fighter doesn't react, keeps fighting, do you keep, what do you guys do? Well, f first off, if you see it, and there's no reaction from the fighter that was fouled and he's continuing on or she's continuing on, then your your sole job is to acknowledge the fact you saw it. Mm -hmm. You don't have to call time, but you come step in and say, hey, watch the knees, get them up or get them down mm -hmm. and just let the fight go on. The, the, real, the real thing here is, you know, it was the second uh, knee – ends up where he takes a point he had the, the yeah. knee right away you know and he, and he takes a point and it's like we take points to do things as far as leveling the playing field meaning that thank you julio arce has been damaged now by these fouls they're unintentional he's trying to throw a knee you know bodies in motion or anything like that but there has to be a leveling of the playing field. Julio Arce will say is he has been diminished as a fighter. And so I've got to level the playing field by taking the point. I didn't see that Arce was, was yeah. diminished as a fighter. And so you have to, you know, a taking of a point is a huge thing in MMA. In a three round and fight, people, it's a huge thing. Exactly. That's the whole point. And that's why it makes it very difficult as, you know, people said, I'll take a point, take a point. If referees took points for all the things that people want, you know, and look at Joe Rogan's one of my favorites. And Joe is, you know, if you stick them in the eye, automatic point deduction. You know, knees, the groin, automatic point deduction. It's like, do you realize how fucked up your fights would be mm -hmm. and how you would be the guy complaining about, oh, you see, he, well, the damn ref took points and that's why he won. He didn't win the fight, he won the point deduction war. Yeah. But, I'm going to go on a, on a fighter's perspective on this is when you take a point in the first round in such a situation where it didn't do, it didn't do any damage. Sure. It was uncomfortable. And you know that the fighter wasn't really compromised. And I'm not saying that, look, there are situations where, look, the guy took it hard in the, in the nods. Okay. And like, you've got to, yeah. you can see that he's really, really 
hurting. Yeah. Then we start talking about taking a point. The growing shot is is one of those things where the person could squat down as I'm throwing the knee or just the height of me versus them can make a difference a on how it things. lands. You know, the actual knee doesn't hit the groin, but the shin does. Yes. There's all kinds of things that happen. We saw that quite a bit, even in the yeah. Salon, uh, Aslan fight where the yeah. Turk, uh, Turkal guy threw the knee and the foot came up and hit him, you know, up in the tank. Yep. So when, but when I'm going back to, um, who was it? Uh, Burns. Julio Arce. Yeah. Arce and Burns. Burns. There was no real, there wasn't a big amount of damage done. You can see it. Arce was ready to fight right away. Let's go. Like not a big deal. The second one, Copeland just stopped the fight. Gary Copeland just stopped the fight, even without Arce really asking for it to be stopped. What I'm getting at is this right from that moment when that point is taken, that fighter, Herbert Burns feels the need to fight a different fight. He feels the need to fight harder. He feels the need to put himself in jeopardizing positions to try to get that point back, to try to make sure that it's not a 10-8 round, try to make it a 9-8 round, whatever. I don't even know how you do this, scoring because I'm retarded. 9-9. Nine, nine. Okay, whatever. I'm, like I said, retarded. <laughs> so, but it it's just, that math. <laughs> that's what happens. Fighters feel the need to try to get it back and I'm not saying that's I'm not saying that's what cost him the fight. He wasn't fighting right. He got hit with some big shots, obviously, in the second round. Boy, he did. But in that first round, he started to try to do a little bit more right after the point was taken. And did he come out in the second round going, look, I lost the first round, probably 10-8. That means I have to win the next two rounds to even get a draw. It's very important to understand what when they take a one point, how that fighter now is perceiving and what his perception is on how he needs to fight the rest of the fight. What do I need to do now to get this fight to at least be a draw? That starts changing. Yeah. You are the ref is altering altering the, the outcome of the fight. Big words, yeah. I like that. <clears throat> but it, it that's why I was I was pretty heated over that. I'm like, there was obviously not a ton of damage where Arce was like, oh man, I can't get up. Oh my cup broke. I mean, I I literally kicked Yama uh, Kid Yamamoto in the nuts so hard it broke his cup and he couldn't yeah. continue. Right? Like that, I can understand. <laughs> it was a clean, hard shot in the nads, yeah. right? Like, I get it. You don't want to keep fighting. Understandable. <laughs> but like most of these fighters, almost all of them are wearing steel cups. Let's not pretend like he had to go to the hospital. Let's not pretend. Well, obviously. Especially at this weight class. <laughs> yeah. Okay? I mean, we've seen guys like... uh Karatanov and, and Matt Mitrione, right? Was it Matt Mitrione? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Got kicked in the nuts and his fucking nut, I guess, apparently swelled. They had to take him to the hospital. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's like, oh, yeah. Oh, no, thank you. No, I, I have seen that, but yeah. Ah, uh, uh, Dennis Buzukia yeah, against Connor Matthews. Actually, a really good fight. Yeah. Buzukia, good fighter. Yeah. Very clean. I, I really liked what I saw out of him. I mean, just put combinations together beautifully. Uh, I thought, you know, Connor Matthews, tough fighter. He just was outmatched by a a, a guy that was more technical, yeah. had good power, and uh, in the end, landed that clean, clean shot. It was pretty much over with that one. Aslan versus Turkal. I thought it was a great fight. You know who Turkal reminds me of? He reminds me of uh, the, uh, what's that? Wow. He, Stefan Bonner. Kind of reminds really? me of Stefan Bonner. The way he bounces a little bit. Every time he takes a shot, every time he takes a punch, kind of knocks him off balance and his hair kind of did the whole shake thing. <laughs> I don't know. I just have images of Stefan Bonner in like a lot of his fights, whether it was with Forrest, uh, you know, against Forrest Griffin or whether it was, you know, with anybody. He, he just, was winning that fight. He was. He was winning that fight. He was. And he just... he. He had big balls and decided to keep staying in that pocket with a guy who had some big power. Yep. So we, sometimes you got to yep. weigh my balls being this and the guy that I'm facing be, his power, <laughs> power being, being this. That. Yeah. But uh, I thought it was a really good fight. If you guys haven't seen that fight, go back and watch that fight. It was a fun fight. Definitely a fun fight to watch. Yeah. Malkoon versus uh, Petrosky. Man, I'll tell you what, you know, <laughs> Jacob Malkoon, we've watched multiple times. From Australia, the guy can wrestle his ass off. I thought it was going to be, you know, the question of who is going to be better. He was obviously not only the better wrestler, his stand up was giving Petrovsky problems. And it was Petrovsky, look, he he dinged himself. Let's just. I was trying. That's did what we happened. ever find out what happened? 
Yeah, he ran it, ran his head into the hip bone, yeah. and it, it hurt him. That's what it looked like. You watched him as he missed. You know, he goes in for the takedown. He, he rattled his own cage. He goes down. Yeah, the body kick. That wasn't what yeah. did it. It was running his head into the hip bone. It happens. We you know, we've seen guys on throws. You know, their head hits the ground. Look at go back to you know, one of your ex training partners, who uh, <laughs> Gray Maynard. <laughs> <laughs> Rob Emerson himself out against Rob Emerson. Rob Emerson, yes. You know, it happens, you know. Mm -hmm. Nico Fatali and Matt Lindland. Matt Lindland no, throwing him. Uh, that's right. Knocked himself out. That's you know? right. I remember that. It happens. I mean, I thought maybe Gary Copeland had another bad stop. This is what started off the night. <laughs> no, I'm just yeah, kidding. No, I'm kidding. No, no. no, it was it was really just a weird situation. He got in on the single and then uh um, yeah, just, you just, could just see how out. stunned he was, yeah. and then he did the yeah, little yeah, stanky leg, body. kind of tumbled he over, just, the little drunken dancer type move. Yeah, man, you you never know what's gonna hurt somebody, and sometimes you know it has nothing to do. Oh, that wouldn't have hurt me. You should try yeah, it. Man. Yeah. <clears throat> well, well, go back up to the to the beginning. There was a there was the uh, was it the was it, hold on go back up. Yeah, it was the okay. Landwehr versus Emmers fight. The uppercut hurt Emmers, but it was the clubbing hand to the back of the ear that actually dropped Emmers. And that's the one that did the damage on that fight. I was actually thinking about that too. I'm like, yeah, it wasn't the very first initial shot. It was the one that caught him right behind the ear that put him down and, and that hurt him bad. Yeah, so All right. Well, those two follow-ups. Well, hey, that's going to wrap up our UFC talk, but let's go ahead and uh, before we move on, though, go to OnlyFans.com slash weighing in. OnlyFans.com slash weighing in. I want to thank you guys so much for supporting us over there. I think we're at about 800 subscribers right now. I want to thank you guys. It's pretty freaking awesome, man. Having some good live chats over there, some Q&A. John joined me for one this month, and I'm going to try to sneak him on over for one more in the early, early month of April. And uh, we're going to go from there, man. I'm looking forward to uh, continuing on with the OF channel, and uh, hope you guys continue to support us over there. So uh, let's go into some fight announcements. We've got Luke Rockhold, Luke Rockhold versus Joe Schilling, April 29th in Dubai at the Karate Combat 45. What do you think of that one? I think it's a fucking fantastic fight. I think it's a really good matchup. I don't think you could have, honestly, like outside of the fighters, I never would have saw this fight ever coming about. I know yeah. that they know each other. I know they like to hang out and have a couple cocktails together. I know yeah. that they're friends. They're both great guys. And they're both great people. Yeah. You know, it's, it's so it, it's so funny because like Schilling is, ah, he's just fucking awesome. Yeah. It's so funny. You know, like, and uh, he's got he's got power. Mm -hmm. Luke is got power. You know, he. I'm not sure he's. You know, if this is a grappling match, I know who wins right away. Oh yeah. If this is if this is a stand up match, I got to give the. Uh, I'm going to say the advantage goes to Schilling. Yeah. You know, the I, I, advantage I'm... goes to him. Do you think? I'm not so? saying he'll win it, but the advantage goes to him. Do you think he goes to him? Yeah. Luke slowed down a little bit, baby. Yeah, he has. So is Joe. But Joe was a legitimate world champion kickboxer and faced the very best in the in the world of kickboxing. Luke was a great MMA fighter. You know, there's a difference when you can't be taken down. Karate combat, you can be hurt and put down. You can be thrown. You know, not a you know, no no double legs, but you can you know, you have a little bit of time on the ground. But Schilling can survive any of that with you know the, the limited amount of time. What I'm looking at is like, I guess for me in karate combat, right? It comes down to you these fighters that are stepping in, like Joe Schilling and Luke Rockhold. You've got to learn to you've got to learn the rules. Yep. Catch the kick, <clears throat> land the strike. When they hit the ground, follow up with some ground up pound. You have about Absolutely. two seconds, five seconds, yep. whatever it is. <clears throat> You've got to know the rules. And so that I think it's going to come down to which fighter knows the rules the best and how they can utilize them to their advantage. Might be. <clears throat> Look at it. Do you know who the champion of that weight class is? Well, I mean, he might be a weight class up now. No. You, smiling Sam Alvey. Shut up. I swear to God. He's the champ. Oh, man. Because he went out there and he just knocks people out. I mean, he's gonna have a he's gonna have a tough task with these two guys if he has to well, fight those the two guys. Of this. That's true. Yeah, <laughs> interesting fight. Interesting fight. Like I look, like I look at 
Joe, I think, is got he's the better striker technic technically. But I also Joe's had some pretty nasty knockouts. Yep. You know, but so and, is Luke. Yeah, so so is Luke. But Luke also I, I look at Luke. Luke still has a little bit of his chin. He still has it. Like, and he can wrestle a little bit, like in terms of catch the kicks, foot sweeps. You know, I I look at athletically, I think Luke's the better. And I'm not I'm not riding it because he's my boy, man. No, no, I'm no. I'm simply saying I think athletically, I think athletically, Luke is probably the better pure athlete. Yeah. You know, I mean, Luke's got to be careful, keep his chin tucked, man. But um, if I looked at more of the advantage, I would say it goes to Luke. Luke is taller. Luke is longer. Luke's You're not taller. Oh, absolutely. He's taller than Joe Schilling. Oh, absolutely not. Luke's almost 6'4", John. Yeah, Schilling's 6'3". Schilling is not 6'3", is he? Yes, he is. He does not seem like he is 6'3". <laughs> like, what, Luke Luke is, is what? 6'2", 6'3". They're both built at six three. There you go. Jeez. All right. Well, <laughs> Joe doesn't seem like his. Joe doesn't. Joe to me doesn't seem as tall as Luke. When I've stood the, next here, to the two of them, this is the one thing I will say. Luke is the healthier fighter. How's that? Because Joe has been a smoker as whole. <laughs> <laughs> this is right crazy, too. some bitch. I love him. <laughs> I think whoever ends up understanding the rules the most and utilizing the rules the most will probably end up winning this fight. That's it might be. Next fight. Both great guys. How does the how does the trip to Dubai affect them? That's the other thing. I don't know. That's the other thing. Oh, this is gonna be a great fight. That is, this should be a fantastic fight. We're gonna see a, we're gonna see a lot about you know this the the real thing in this one is look at what it says. Main, main event. Event. Done. Meaning five rounds. Done. Okay, I I, th- I think his I think his O's gone. Okay, it could be. Yeah, I think his O's. Well, he's gonna gone. have a hard. T- it's I, I believe that Kamzat can definitely get Robert to the ground. Yeah. Okay, especially in the first round, but he better do some damage to Robert in that first round with all the uh, effort it's gonna take for him to get him to the ground and everything and keep him there. He's gonna have to be in great shape. And know that Whitaker is going to come out just as strong in the second and third and fourth mm-hmm. and fifth. And you've got to get through all of that. So, you know, five rounds makes a difference in the, in the fight world. Yeah, let me preface this by saying this. In the first round, two rounds, I'm, I'm, I'm going to lean a little bit more ch- towards Chemayev. But I'm not putting Whitaker out of it either. Because Chemayev fights very careless. He fights, you know, he fights so reckless. He fight, It's very entertaining for the fans. I'm not knocking that because I enjoy it. I enjoy no, the shit out no, of it. He's, no, like, he's fun to watch. He, he absolutely he is. You know, and, and when, when he's, when I know he's got a fight coming up, I'm tuning in because I enjoy watching him fight. That's right. There's something yeah. about him that makes people want to watch him fight. It's his aggressiveness, his carelessness, his recklessness, all those things. The way he talks trash, very Khabib-ish, just but yeah. Khabib had more respect. But he has, you know, but he's still fun. He's fun to um to watch fight. I just don't believe that he has been the same since he had COVID. His lungs, I think, are fucked up. I think his his conditioning and cardio, sure, he's been fighting at a good pace, but there's no way a guy coming from 170, Usman, uh, Kamar Usman, should have came up and given you that type of fight in the third round and won the third round when yep. you had a full camp. I just True. believe there's some, there's some underlying issues that he just hasn't been able to figure out. So hopefully he gets it figured out. But look, if this fight goes into the third, fourth, and fifth, I think it's going to be all Rob Warrick. Yeah, see, I, I like it close to Sam. Look, first and second round, I go with Jemayev. Mm-hmm. Third, fourth, fifth, I go with Robert Whitaker. Yeah, true. We're going to find out. We're going to find out, though. I, look, Robert Whitaker looked fantastic look, his last looked fight. Looked good in his last fight. That's right. Really damn good. So yeah. we'll see. Next fight. <clears throat> <laughs> The Black Beast, Derek Lewis, taking on Rodrigo Nascimento. Uh, you know, this is a, a banger's brawl because heavyweights, we know that the Derek has got power. Nascimento, is, he's got power. He likes to, you know, box from the outside. He likes to stick and move. He likes to use his uh, kicks every now and then. But he's going to have a hard time, I think, with the rushes that Derek Lewis likes to employ into his attacks and when he decides to go look at lewis is not a slow human being as a big man he's got speed Mm -hmm. it's just you know and he's smart about how he uses it 
And uh, Nascimento is going to have to really put him on his back foot. And I'm not sure that he has that uh, one-punch power that is going to make Derek Lewis uh, give him the same respect as we've seen with some people. If the fight's not in Texas, I'm probably going to go Derek Lewis, <clears throat> which is not. It's in <laughs> St. Louis. So can't, Derek can't, can't buy a win in can't. Texas, man. No. Nah. So... I'm going to lean towards Derek Lewis. I want to see the Black Beast get the mic, man. Take his fucking drawers off and say my balls are hot. That's what I want to see. Uh, it should be it should be a good fight, though. I think uh, if Nasimir Manto can come forward and yep. avoid the big shots and use a little bit of speed to get himself in, get out, and circle and stay directly out of line of Derek Lewis's big punches and his explosions, he may have a chance. <clears throat> but I, I don't know. That's going to be kind of hard to do. It's going to be hard. Yeah. We're going to find out. Next fight. Ah. Oh. Sergey Pavlovich going up against Drago in Alexander Volkov. And Volkov was scheduled to face mm -hmm. Almeida, but that was put away to the side. And now we have him going up against Sergey Pavlovich. Dave, you said there's some, some backstory to this. Talk to us. Dave. <laughs> Sorry, I have my thing on mute because uh, my family doesn't know how to not vacuum the house while I'm recording a podcast. <laughs> uh, yes, so here's the article. So he was scheduled to fight G uh, Gerald Gilton. Almeida. Um, and then here's what came out. Uh, let me just go. Oh, let me find it here. I had to quote earlier. Oh, yeah. Uh, Volkov and Pavlovich were not going to fight each other. They are, they're on good terms, periodically training together. Such a fight is only possible if it is a challenger or title fight. Uh, Volkov is also, uh, is also already had a contract in hand for a fight against Brazilian Almeida. Now there will be negotiations between the league and managers to have the fight between Volkov and Pavlovich cancelled. Mm. Yep. So we don't even know what we have. We don't know what we have, but I think we have a damn good fight if it does happen. Interesting fight. Yeah, they're both going to stand and trade. Uh, Volkov, yeah. I think Volkov's going to get the short end of the stick on this, even though he's the taller, longer fighter. Pa pa Pavlovich's got the power. Yeah, he's definitely got the power. He's also got the wrestling. Yeah, You know, his uh, his wrestling wasn't great when he was at AK, but it was definitely good enough to take uh, Volkov down and control the top position and land some big shots. And on the feet... <clears throat> You know, we saw with the Black Beast what he, what he did to Volkov once he touched him, and I think Pavlovich got the cleaner striking, able to get to the chin. He'll have to, he'll have a hard time getting past Volkov's push, kick, and reach in the beginning, but as he starts to find his timing and his range, I think yeah. he'll be able to get him out of there. <clears throat> I think that's probably why. Another one of these guys, you know, they don't want to beat each other. They want to keep each other <laughs> in the rankings. They want to make sure that one of them rises to the top and. I've seen them train together. They're both they're they're both equally talented in their own way. One day, one day, one guy has a good uh, has a good day, and the other day, one one has the one, advantage. Yeah, the other one has the, the advantage. Next, the other day, so definitely some good training sessions I've seen out of them too. So um, we'll see what happens as time goes on. But Dave, what else you got for us, buddy? Well, I think that's going to wrap us up for today. So go to WayneAndMerch.com. WayneAndMerch.com. No, 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 oh. no, 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 oh, shit, no. I'm, I'm sorry. Forgot. I almost. forgot. I'm, I'm used to him, but yeah, we do have a clip. We you do have a clip. Let's go ahead and play Tried this. to get away with it. I am tired of the bullshit. <laughs> for those you guys can't see my face, I'm getting a little At nervous. the start of the UFC from... New Jersey, Brendan Fitzgerald did a fantastic job of putting out an absolute fucking lie. Now, I'm not saying it's Brendan Fitzgerald's fault because I'm sure someone told him that bullshit and he just, oh, okay. But he actually said that. Well, wait, wait. We have a clip. Do you have the clip? Okay, Dave? go. Dave, you have the clip? Oh, shit. Yeah, sorry. Here we go. <laughs> sorry, guys. I'm like trying to like just minimize background noise here. Um, but yes, I do have a clip right here. I'll let me play the audio for you. When the Fertitta family bought the UFC in the early 2000s and installed Dana White as president, mixed martial arts was regulated in one state in the U.S. That would be New Jersey, Atlantic City. Really? What a bunch of horse shit that line is. <laughs> you know, I look at it and it's like, how many times do you see, you know, people talking about commentary and, hey, do your homework and stuff like that? And it's like, if you're going to put that out, you better make sure it's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and in the 2000s, 
All right. Let's uh, say that, no, there was quite a few states that regulated MMA. Okay. The first state that regulated MMA, if you're going to really look at it, was Mississippi. Billy Lyons was the commissioner of, of Mississippi. He's the first one that ever issued me a license as someone that worked for the state athletic commission. Okay. How about Iowa was another Alabama. There was a bunch of fights in there. Their commission was, you know, in and out. So it was like, eh. but they did fights there all the time. The same thing. New Jersey was done before the Fertitas were ever, you know, owners of the UFC UFC 28 was done in New Jersey. That was the first fight ever in the state of New Jersey for the UFC. They had one fight before it, and the UFC was the second MMA show that New Jersey did. You know, and that was UFC 28 that had uh, Randy Couture against Rand, uh, Kevin Randleman in the uh, finals in the main event. But to sit there and to sit there, you know, say that oh, in the 2000s and the Fertitas bought the UFC. In 2000, at the start of 2000, well, end of 2000, had their first show was UFC 30, but New Jersey was not the first state to regulate MMA, and it wasn't the only state when they bought it that was regulating MMA. So quit trying to change history. Hmm. God damn it. <clears throat> fucking drives me fucking crazy. If you can't get it right, don't freaking say anything. There comes a lot of responsibility with that. <laughs> play-by-play play player there's a lot you got guys that are fantastic i mean people like to knock mar ronaldo but the guy's a fucking yeah. walking dictionary the guy encyclopedia he yeah encyclopedia i should say not dictionary my apologies he yeah. is someone that has been through the history of it all he's done pride he's done he's done uh strike force he's done elite xc done he's done everything done wwe like he's done everything he knows the he knows from like people think like like and I'm not it's not a knock on Aaron Hawani. Aaron Hawani is a big WWE fan. I can tell you right now that no one knows more about WWE than Mar Ronaldo. Nobody. Nobody that I fucking have ever met. And I'm not a WWE guy, but I know including Podcast Dave. Including po- <laughs> Podcast Dave doesn't have a doesn't even know like the, he has for Marl's forgot more things than, than Podcast Dave's ever known about WWE. That's yeah. how de- he is just such an encyclopedia, or uh, yeah, encyclopedia of it. Sean Grandy, when he does his intros, he does the research of the city they're in. He does the research of the state they're in. Does the research of how what fighters have fought in there. John Anik does a great job as well, and he yep. has made he's made countless posts. And I'm not trying to take a knock at um at Brendan, but I'm simply saying like there's a lot of work that goes into this and making sure that the history of what you are saying is true. And in this situation, it wasn't. But then again, let's go back to Winston Churchill. What did he say? John, what did he say? History is written by the victors. Absolutely. The bottom line is the UFC right now is the victors. Dana White, Lorenzo Fertitta, Frank Fertitta, they're the victors, man. They bought it. They're trying to, whether they're trying to rewrite history or whatever it is they're trying to do, they're shaping it. And, uh, you know, and as time goes down the line, they will. They will do more interviews. They'll do more podcasts. They'll do more media, interview, whatever it is. All that. And, things- and, the pe- and the people like me that know, we die off. But let me ask you this, though. Are they doing it on purpose or is are they doing it based off of what they remember? Because, you know, if you tell something so many times, it start you start to believe it. Yeah, if you tell a lie enough times. Well, sometimes that's how they remember it. Yeah. Okay. I'm not saying that it's not a lie. I'm just simply saying it's that's how they remember it all happening. So I know it, it ends up being a lie in the long run, but is it not really meaning to be? It's not. They're not. It's, they're not trying to make it a lie. No. Look, I I listened to uh, Dana on the Lex Friedman show, and you know, and, Lex and is a great could, interviewer, by the way. Absolutely yeah, love the show. And, and you could look, and and I, and I really enjoyed what because what he was saying throughout most of it, and. You're looking and I go, okay, I remember that. I remember that. I remember that. You know, like I first met Lorenzo Fertitta at UFC 21. Okay. It was in Des Moines, Iowa. It was uh, a fight that he, along with Glenn Carano, Gina Carano's father. Played for the Dallas Cowboys, correct? Yes. Flip Homansky, 
who was the chief medical advisor for uh, the Nevada State Athletic Commission. And, and like I could get into the truth of what occurred and how it occurred and what was done and what was dirty and what wasn't. But the truth is, back then, you know, he was Lorenzo was sitting on the Nevada State Athletic Commission. He was a commissioner. And he came out to watch the UFC because the UFC was trying to become regulated in the state of Nevada. And back then, you know, I know Dana tells the story of, um, you know, he uh, was with Frank Fertitta and they see John Lewis in the casino and Frank Fertitta recognizes John Lewis, he says, and goes over and, you know, they talk to him and end up going to his school. I gave Lorenzo Fertitta John Lewis's phone number and address of his school back at UFC 21. I had dinner with him that night, sat down, explained all the fights and said, look, this is a guy in Las Vegas. This is the guy, I, if I, if you want to know about this sport and you want to understand it, go talk to John, you know, set up, you know, John will, John will show you things. He'll put you in these positions so you'll understand them because, you know, at the time, Lorenzo looks, he goes, I don't like the fact that they're hitting people on the ground, right? And I go, and, you know, Back then, my, my whole thing, look, I understand that. I said, you are someone that comes from the world of boxing. You, you know, you understand boxing. I go, but you need to understand. We get an idea of fighting from movies. I said, you watch John Wayne in a fight in the movies. John Wayne hits a guy, knocks him to the ground. John Wayne doesn't go over and mount him and start throwing elbows. John Wayne grabs him, picks him up, stands him back up, and punches him again to knock him over again. And he looks at me and goes, yeah. <laughs> and I go, that's not real fighting, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it, and that was just the way it was back then. But I, I just look at, there's truth to everything. And, and as you say, people are going to remember their truth. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and I totally understand that. And I don't, I listen to like what Dana says now, and I have nothing bad to say about anything. And look, Dana's had a huge impact on this sport, but you know, I heard him on the Lex Friedman and he was talking about, you know, you know, he was doing a, uh, you know, negotiations for Tito Ortiz and he was trying to bring Chuck Liddell and the UFC didn't want Chuck Liddell. Chuck Liddell was in the UFC. Mm. What are you talking about? He was first in the UFC at UFC 17. Then he fought Jeremy Horn. I mean, he was, he, he was a fighter. I, I had referenced how many times, you know, and you're going to sit there and say the UFC didn't want Chuck Liddell. Okay. I understand what you're, the way you're saying it, but it comes out like, oh, they didn't think Chuck was a good fighter. They didn't want him. No. That's not exactly what was going on. They were out of money. That something's always kind of I've always wanted. Maybe you can give me more input on this. And if you don't feel comfortable, that's fine. But is what happened with the John Lewis thing? Because John Lewis was supposed to be the Joe Silva of the sport, correct? Yeah. And no, they they were going to make John Lewis the matchmaker. Yeah. For the UFC. And uh, I I'll tell you straight out, it was uh, Jeff Blatnick. Um, Jeff, Joe, Joe Silva was a fanboy of the UFC. Okay, and this is before Zufa. Not just the UFC. And, he was a fanboy of Shuto oh, and yeah, Ruben yeah. Asato. Dude, was he was a, fan, yeah. he was a fanboy of freestyle fighting. Yeah. Shuto, he loved Ruben Asato, mm -hmm. Mak Sakurai, yep. all of them. He was just a huge fan. And uh, he was someone that, while the UFC was owned by Semaphore, he was sending them, you know, hey, you guys should do this. He was sending them, you know, emails because the internet was just, you know, coming up and stuff. And and with that, they would send him a poster for, you know, whatever it was. And he kind of, you know, was in this position where they would, you know, he would tell them about a certain fighter. And then Jeff Blatnick, who was a commentator, color commentator for the UFC, working <clears> along <throat> first Bruce Beck and then working with uh, Mike Goldberg, he hired Joe Silva to be his kind of uh, biographer to research yep. material, give him information on fighters and stuff like that. And Joe did a great job with it. And so when the UFC was bought by the Fertitas, they brought, you know, they brought me out. They brought Jeff out. And Jeff was the one that suggested to Dana and uh, Lorenzo, hey, I th you need to talk to Joe Silva. He really knows these fighters. And then, you know, who's Joe Silva? Look, he's this guy. You know, 
and they bring Joe out and talk, and they gave Joe the job over John Lewis. And you know, and look, let's be honest, <laughs> Joe did a great job. Fantastic, did did a great job, and so it was you know a smart hire by Dana and Lorenzo, or by <clears throat> which, whichever one decided to make that choice. But yeah, that's how Joe Silva got the job over john lewis because he john lewis was supposed to be the matchmaker i say it was a great job um he did a great job he did a fantastic job even though he didn't want to sign me dana white had to sign <laughs> me. but i would still say he he did a great job he always found he was a fan of the sport yeah he, was. he wasn't a fan of just american fighters <laughs> excuse me or brazilian fighters he was a fan of all of them and if yeah. there was a fighter out there that was making waves, whether in Brazil, whether in Japan, whether in UK, wherever it was, he was, he was set out to try and find him, whether in Canada, you know, and, um, he did a Don't great get job. on his bad side. <clears throat> oh, no, he's a, he'd be, he's a mean little bastard. Yeah, he was. Yon, yon, yon. He's, you know, what? he gets a he bad set rap. You up with the worst fights ever. He gets a bad rap, but I kind of like the guy. He, he always used to try and strong arm you, you know, but if well, you, if you played a little hardball back, he kind of sometimes, I wouldn't say he folded, but he kind of understood where you're coming from. But then there's times where he really tried to stick it to you. Yeah. Let's say this about Joe. And because a lot of people, you know, are, man, what a great, you know, job that was. And it was, you know, it was a great job for him. But Joe looked at it in, in two lights. He looked and he said, man, he goes, I have one of the greatest jobs ever in that I get to make guys' dreams come true. I get to sign them to the UFC. He goes, and I have the worst job in the fucking world because I break their fucking hearts. Mm -hmm. I cut them from the UFC. Yeah. And, he, and you look and you go, and, and that's why, you know, when they sold, he left. They gave him a, a, a very nice uh, mm -hmm. part of that, that sale and he had enough money. He says, yeah, I'm done. You know, and, you know, people don't hear from him. They don't hear from I him. I know. I would love to try to get him on the show. Just not to talk about the history of it all, but just to talk about him and what he's doing now and his life now. Yeah. I mean, he's he's definitely... Uh, Maybe I'll call him. Yeah. Yeah. Do so, man. I'd love to... Like, look, I don't want to talk about the relationship with him and Dana. I don't want to talk about any other stuff with the U. I want to talk about, no, like, no, no, you no, know, no. what's he doing now? And, like, you know, what were, yeah. what were your... What, what made well, you... What, what made, was your thoughts on this? Yeah, what attracted you to, like, some of these fighters when you first signed them, you know, and you were... Those are the things like what, what, how'd you find GSP? Like, these are all things I want to know about, yeah. you know? I mean, what was, I know there was a, a really uh weird relationship with the, with the BJ Penn situation. Oh know? my yeah. God. <laughs> so there's tons of history behind all these things, you know, just a little bit on those. So, yeah. all right, guys, wait, that's go ahead. No, no, nope. this is a tr true. That's going to wrap up our, that's going to wrap up our two hour long show just for you guys. On a fight night of all things, God right? Damn, like, was that that long? Two hours. Two it hours. doesn't what seem that long when do? you're spending time with this jawline, right? That's what happens. Is that what it is? Yeah, it definitely. Is it's just happens. the intelligence of what you say. Absolutely. Think, right? You know what I've noticed, John? Our shows go really well when I just ask you questions. <laughs> That's. I'm, I'm figuring this out. Like I, I'm telling you guys, man. I've learned that. Like now is. I just I just ask more questions, even if I already know the answer. I ask because I know people at home and people that listen to our show they don't know. So like tonight with yeah. the whole with the whole thing about you know John uh, John Lewis, great. Yeah. I'd ask you because I know I've, yeah. I've heard I've you know I wanted to hear oh, if it was yeah. actually true or not, but I've heard. But I know people at home have no idea probably who the fuck John Lewis is. That's one, true. you know. And some of these new people don't even know who the fuck Joe Silva is. So <laughs> John's now a very good stunt man and a good actor. Yeah. That's what I've heard. Yeah. Yeah, that's what right. I've heard. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, Hey, uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed this two hour long show. Go to Wayne and merch.com. Pick some of our apparel there. And please, if you guys enjoyed this show, hit the subscribe button down below, hit the thumbs up bell notifications. Thank you guys so much. I know we're late on the delivery, but guess what? It's Easter Sunday. So that's it. You guys should have been spending time with family anyways. You had kids that you had to be with, Absolutely. and I had bulls that I had to be with. Yes, you love them bulls. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Christ. And John, take us away, buddy. For everyone out there, I hope you had a fantastic Easter Sunday. Take care of the people around you, and we will see you.